Hey everyone, uh, welcome to, uh, I'm actually not too sure what number it is, is it the fifth workshop uh, of <laughs> StarkNet Hackathon? There's been so many, I can't keep count. Uh, but yeah, um, we are joined by Silv, he's the founder of Bricks. Silv, welcome, thank you so much for coming today. Um, and uh, the workshop is titled How to Build Better NFTs with Bricks. Uh, so it's going to be a great workshop, we're going to be touching on NFTs again. Um, there is one thing I just want to start off with. Please make sure you've registered for the hackathon. It's going to be the first link I drop. Uh, so there it is. Um, and uh, make sure you've all signed up and hopefully building a project. Uh, you know, just get there. It doesn't have to be complete at the end. Just get it done. Uh, and then the second thing would be yeah. engagement's been super, super good. Uh, but please make sure you're asking questions. The more questions, the better. Uh, and uh, yeah, so make sure you're asking questions at the workshop. Um, and uh, you can fire away at any stage, Silver so said. So just throw them in there and he'll be able to answer them straight away for you. Uh, but yeah, um, if you can have your cameras on, as always, uh, we love to see cameras on. Um, uh, if not, understandable. Uh, and thanks so much to Prashan and Fox for always having your cameras on. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, but enough for me. I'll be dropping links uh, during the presentation. Uh, Silva, over to you. Thank you so much. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, for having me here. Um, I would so I'm I'm very good friend with Sean from Aspect. So we already talked about what he's talked about regarding NFTs. So I will try to do something that is a little bit different. So the way I want this session to go is I will explain to you a little bit what we do about Brick. Um, then I will deep dive about how you can leverage stuff on Stocknet to actually build interesting things. Why we should do it and give you exact pointers of how we implemented this specifically um, for, uh, for Brick. So if that's all set, I will quickly boot up the presentation. So hello, folks. I'm still from Brick. Um, here's what we'll exactly uh, cover. I'm just repeating myself. So Brick is a two-people team. It's uh, myself, who handles everything but code, and that's my co-founder, who handles uh, everything about um, code. So what we do at Brick is, um, we are building an NFT building protocol. Think of it as like Lego, but running entirely on the blockchain. So to explain to you exactly what we built, what we've built, uh, I will start with yet another question, which is, what do you think an NFT actually is? Uh, I'm looking, I will not judge. Uh, send me your more, your, 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 the hottest take. Uh, yeah, the, your face is orange. My face is orange all the time because of this, uh, of this presentation. I should try a light to turn up orange. So, okay, shoot me your, your answer to that question in the in the chat. Uh, promise I will not judge you. What do you think an NFT is? I was expecting that one. That's the perfect uh, perfect answer, Prashant. Thank you. Thank you for this one. Um, so usually the, the way that people conceptualize the way an NFT work is um, it's a representation of something. Sometimes they will say that it's... Um, like a digital digitized copyright. Sometimes they will say that it's the tokenized version of something else. And that has, of course, as you said, Fox, it has the, the, the property of being non-fungible, meaning that two different NFTs are not uh, the same. Uh, I will offer uh, maybe a weird definition for what how you should conceptualize what an NFT is. And that's an NFT is actually an object. Um, I would argue that NFTs are not representation of a real world asset. The very interesting uh, trick that an NFT is able to do is to, there's a very philosophical concept to do this, which is called to reify, is to make a thing out of something. When you create an NFT, you're actually building an object. You're not referencing something that exists outside of the real world. When I'm creating uh, like a board, when they created the board age, they, they created 8,000 items. And these 8,000 items are not representation of something else. And it's very funny when you start thinking about NFTs this way, because you realize that people are actually very, um, very uh, attached to their NFTs, the same way they would be to like their fairy jersey or an art piece. When you start piecing these things together, you're like, okay, the, the way people conceptualize these NFTs is a bit like a physical item like a real world asset. And they actually have the same properties. You can use an NFT any way you want it. You can carry around uh, different metaverses. You can use it in this context or any different smart contract. You can benefit financially from using it, uh, from like you can lend it, you can collateralize it, you can put it in a smart contract with 10 other friends. And third one, which is the weirdest one, 
you can lose it. You can lose your NFTs. You hear stories about board apes getting hacked all the time. And when you think about it, it's the first time in history that you're able to uh, steal a digital item. It, there's no such thing as like stealing a JPEG where there's only abundance. But with NFTs, because they're objects, you have a sense that you can lose them, destroy them, uh, or get them or have them stolen, which is very, very strange when you think about them. So I would argue that the correct framework that you should have um, when you're conceptualizing NFTs is to think of them as objects. Very strange. So on with this metaphysical knowledge, uh, how do we go from there to break? So we, we have this idea with my co-founder Lancelot that, okay, NFTs are objects. How can we apply this to solve something about NFTs that we believe hasn't been solved, which is interoperability. Interoperability is the idea that it's very, very easy to have an NFT carry around different worlds, that you can mix them with other ones, that your little Axie will go into the sandbox or the central land very, very uh, smoothly. And it's a vision that has that we really has yet to materialize. Um, so we thought, OK, there's this problem. And we also consider that NFTs are objects. So maybe we should try and see if there's an example in the real world of a physical item that is highly interoperable. So what's the most highly interoperable uh, physical item that you know of? Something that you can build with, something that you can compose with. So if anyone has thought about Lego and the very subtle subliminal message that is right behind me, uh, you're correct. The most uh, interoperable item that we can think of is actually Lego. So we just built exactly that. Funny enough, we discovered this tweet from Nietzsche from Varian Fun like two months in the, in the process of building Brick. So we felt very good about ourselves. Um, so the way you have to conceptualize what Brick is, it's Lego, but on the blockchain. Basically, you have these uh, ERC 1155 tokens that are called Bricks. We give them the representation of a voxel. These uh, tokens, you can use them in the one, you can transfer them, use them, uh, whatever. They have the very cool ability to be able to assemble into a single NFT. So here you have six different bricks that create a single NFT. And when you create this NFT, the brick balance is transferred to the newly created NFT. If you decide that you're bored with your NFT, you disassemble it, you get the bricks back, and you can build something else. So picture brick as like uh, NFT matter or Exactly like Lego. I think that would be the most apt way to consider it. So it's not a game. It's more like a toy. So we built an entire interface to actually help you build with Brick. Uh, so uh, I apologize again. It's extremely orange. And everything over here is happening in your browser. So you're able over here to use the 65 Bricks um, in the screen. You create exactly what you want. And then you're able to mint it as a single NFT that you own uh, forever. What we wanted to build doing this is a very simple way for people to actually build with NFTs and interact with them. Currently, you either need to be a hardcore developer or a graphic designer, but there's just nothing in between. And by building a very easy to use interface and a very easy to grasp protocol, we actually wanted people to be able to build whatever they wanted, to build their own objects, which was the vision all along. So the way Brick works is you have the builder contract at the top of the builder. Uh, which is the front end at the top left. <clears throat> we store data directly on our back end uh, and soon on IPFS. This is used to provide an API to third parties so that you can get different file formats so that you can, for instance, use it in on cyber, use it in the sandbox or any other metaverse out there thanks to different file formats. And it's mainly just two contracts, the one that manages the bricks and the one that manages the sets. And that's about that. So we were the first uh, protocol deployed on Stock and Mainnet at the end of December, um, which actually caused a bit of issues. And we've been uh, on Stock and ever since. We are highly interoperable and highly interoperated with uh, most of the other protocols running on Stock and at the moment. And to give you an idea of what the community has built, every single creation that you see here was built with Brick using the builder on Brick. So you have some very, very impressive creations. Like at the bottom left, this is a loot realm. Some of the community decided to actually build an entire castle out of them. Um, 
Yeah, the contracts are open source on GitHub. Uh, there's a link at the at the bottom of the presentation. I will send you send it out. It's a brick, uh, brick NFT on uh, on GitHub. Some numbers so far uh, since we've been on testnet, so probably like mid December, hundred and twelve thousand. NFTs built. So these numbers are to be taken with a grain of salt, but virtually half uh, to three quarters of all the active wallets on Startnet have interacted with Brick um, out there. So 82,000 unique creations with Brick. That's some very impressive, uh, impressive numbers. What makes Brick than other platforms out there? Could you rephrase this? I'm not sure I got it, uh, Ashwan. Okay, I'll come back to this uh, afterwards. Some other stuff that people have built uh, on the right hand side, we're actually integrated with another metaverse currently. So one guy, the Rouge Wars here, was a very talented builder. Uh, yeah, they are in the eighty-two thousand. They are about twice this on the testnet. Uh, so it's already a pretty big community. Um, so this guy on the right hand side, he actually built an entire city out of brick. And thanks to our metaverse integration, he was he was so happy to actually be able to like walk around the city he had created. That was. Uh, that's a bit of an aha moment for him. Um, some other stuff that people have built, there is one French guy who's building an entire PFP collection out of brick. So here, it's been about three to four months, and he's cranking out one new dock built out of brick every day. Uh, so you've got Napoleon dock, Gucci dock, uh, and he's building like an entire thing on top of brick, which was just crazy when we discovered that happened. And that's about that. Um, one of the first things that actually happened to us when we come out on mainnet, uh, trailblazing things on Starknet comes at a price, um, is that we massively clogged the network and Starkware very politely asked us to stop costing them 12 to 20k a day because back then they were subsidizing the transaction costs. So work building on a, on a layer two like Starknet is very, very fun, uh, but it also comes with its own sets of challenges. So that's it. Uh, we'll be back next week with a major update, uh, and I will give you a little bit of a teaser of what is coming next for a break. If you listen carefully, I told you it looks a bit like Lego, so I'm wondering what's coming next for, uh, for us. All right, that was the break presentation. Off to the meaty part. Um, why should you build on StockNet? <clears throat> Mainly people want to build on StockNet because it's cheap and it's fast. People, if you've during this presentation, you already know what a layer two is. Uh, you do know that it's just faster, it's cheaper. It's just going to be all around more efficient to do it. So it's like a net benefit uh, compared to just building on a layer one. I would argue that there are actually more reasons to this. It's First of all, it's actually a lot funnier because you actually need to build a lot of stuff on StockNet. Um, there, it's not only copy paste. There are a lot of things that have to be invented here because Cairo is different. So you do need to be able to think us outside the box when you are building these things. You can actually build new stuff. Brick is not some is what I call like an illegal ID. It's not something that you can build on a layer one because the the computation power required just makes it prohibitive. So it's a it's an L2 native application. It's not something that we could build on a layer one. And when you think about like the three big crypto games, Axie Infinity, so rare and um, I always forget the third one. CryptoKitties, they always had they they all had the same problem back in 2018, which is that the layer one just does not support uh, their use case. It's just not possible. And Axie and CryptoKitties decided to build their own chain, uh, and Sora decided to go on the StarkX. So if you want to build something uh, that just pushes the boundaries of what L1 can do, you have to do it on the layer one. So you can build new stuff. And the last one, the last reason is um, it's a bit of it's it's something that I realized very early on, which is that the way we're handling things on L1 is already outdated. Um, people, for, for blockchain to be completely mainstream, it has to be absolutely invisible, and for it to be invisible, you cannot have clunky wallets, you cannot have twenty dollar transaction fees. None of that is going to happen. So I am absolutely convinced that the next wave of users are never going to see the light of a layer one. Doing a transaction on that one and waiting two hours to get your confirmation or paying $150 in gas for an NFT mint would be a thing of the past, a bit like we used to connect with the internet through a modem. Like we're just never going to touch a layer one uh, anymore. I actually think that's 
like the strongest reason to start building native applications on layer twos very early on. How do you build cool stuff on StockNet? The first advice uh, that I have here is what, what we very jokingly call the gospel of RoboTeddy. RoboTeddy was a very talented dev. He's still alive, so he's still a very talented dev. That worked on Cairo uh, very, very early on, like about September, I think. And he built a, I, I put all of these, these as resources at the end of the presentation, so you'll be able to have them. He compiled a bit of best practices very early on of what kind of mindset you should have when you're building in Cairo. And the very funny thing he said is computation is cheap, storage is expensive. So that should guide you when you're thinking about designing applications on StockNet. Always go for, well, how can I save on a storage slot and how can I make this a computation? Second advice is just free your mind. Um, some builders try to copy paste everything from Ethereum, right from L1. Uh, we even have tools that help you do this, called Warp, for instance. Warp is a tool that helps you convert Solidity to Cairo. Uh, I think it works really, really well. What I'm trying to say here is you can copy paste projects that are working on L1 and put them on L2. You can build another AMM, you can build another something that works marginally better, let's say. Um, what really grinds my gears and what really interests me in L2s is, okay, what can we now build that wasn't possible before? Brick is one of these applications. There are many others out there. So we cannot run on a layer one. And that's the kind of thing that I want you to um, exit the presentation with. Like just start building new things and uh, break free of the shackles of the layer one. So about freeing your mind. Why do you think a billion people will be using layer twos? Uh, that's something that Itamar, the Argent CEO, told me. He said, okay, even assuming that all the other layer twos, like Optimism, Arbitrum, all of them end up with the exact same efficiency as StockNet, uh, all of them has 0.01 cent transaction fees and blazingly fast execution, what's going to be the differentiator? And the massive difference is going to be account abstraction. So for those of you that are not familiar with what this is, um, on layer one, you have two types of objects. You have smart contracts and you have what are called EOAs or externally owned addresses. It's a dichotomy uh, at the protocol level. Account abstraction is a change at the protocol level that says, okay, from now on, there are only going to be smart contracts plus Smart contracts can pay for their fees. These are two very, very strange uh, and very like simple sounding changes, but it actually changes absolutely everything. Currently on layer one, uh, let's say I have my, uh, my trusty Ledger Nano, uh, and I want to delegate to authorize Jake to spend $50 per day. I can't do that. I would like to... Uh, if you've used a DeFi protocol, you need to, okay, I need to approve the token, then I need to swap the token, then I need to disapprove. And these are three separate transactions for which I'm going to pay 100 to 2,000 gas, 200,000 gas, every single transaction. It would be really cool if you could batch all of them, but you can't do that through an EOA because an EOA is one transaction doing one thing to one small contract. So you can't like piggyback on all of them. Account abstraction solves all of this. If all your wallets are smart contracts, you're able to put arbitrary logic in it. You can have a contract with a plugin that says, okay, I'm going to allow Jake to transact once per day and only up to $50 of USDC. You can have, you can, you, you get transaction batching for free, meaning that you can say, okay, I want to approve, swap, and disapprove uh, spending this token in one single transaction. And you don't have to think about, okay, is the, is the smart contract implementing multi-call or not? Um, if there are so many cool things that you can do with a kind of abstraction. And when you're designing your applications, keep this in mind. So the, the way most designs are done on L1, take into account that the, the user is going to have to whip out their nano every single action. This is not necessarily something that you have to do on StockNet. And I will argue that's the biggest differentiator for StockNet currently compared to like ZK Sync and Polygon. Um, ZK Sync is implementing some sort of an account of abstraction, but it's a bit wishy-washy. And we're really yet to see if it has the same applications. 
currently on, on StartNet, you already have the so aspect, for instance, they're using this to build an actual transaction cart on their website. You click on three different, uh, three different items. Okay, I want to buy these three NFTs. Just click on them, and they're just piling up transactions very, very easily. There's no other logic than that. So it's, it's just so powerful. Uh, you'll be able to delegate calls to other people. You'll be able to create wallets on behalf of other users. It's just great. Um, little story here. Uh, the first um, StockNet hackathon uh, in Amsterdam in April 22 was actually built building a session key system. Uh, so a session key, what is it? It's, uh, there are a lot of people that are trying to build games on StockNet. And the problem with building things on chain is every single action requires a transaction. So let's say StockNet is very efficient, very performant, then you just sign in transactions every other second and it's mayhem. So what the session key does is, okay, I'm going to sign a transaction that allows this that allows my, my contract to spend money on this account, on this address for a certain period of time. It's a bit like the arcade. You're just putting money in the machine. It's okay, in five minutes, I'll be done. That's the kind of stuff that you're able to do with the kind of instruction. So just look it up. Keep this in mind when you're, when you're building an application. Computing crazy stuff. Um, <clears throat> to give you a sense of what is now possible, now that we have very, very cheap computation, there's something called proof of storage. Um, a proof of storage is a way to prove a fact on chain. Link for session key implementation. Yeah, it's at the bottom of the, of the presentation. Um, what is a proof of storage? A proof, there, it, it's not possible to know facts about the, to know past facts about the chain from a smart contract, for instance. Um, you cannot have a smart contract know what the gas price was 300 blocks ago. You cannot ask a smart contract who was the owner of uh, this NFT at that time. You don't have access to past data. So what proof of storage allow you to do is um, using Merkle proofs, and you're asking a smart contract about a fact. So you're saying, okay, is there Merkle proof? Here's what I'm asking you. Is, there, is it true that I blocked something, something, something? Uh, this user owned an NFT. Um, is it true that at this block, this user owned this NFT? And the smart contract will say yes or no. It's just like pure magic. Um, the problem is it's super expensive like in computation. Luckily, we have StockNet. So there's a company called Herodotus that is actually building this on chain. Okay, that's, that's very theoretical. How can you actually implement it? There's one project who is already implementing it. It's called Dope Wars. Dope Force is a game running on StockNet, entirely on chain. Uh, but they have their NFTs on Arbitrum. Arbitrum is another layer two. So how do you manage to bridge these two? What you could do is ask your users to bridge all their assets from Arbitrum to L1 and back to StockNet. It's very clunky. You don't do that. So what the Dopeforce team has done, which is amazingly clever, is using storage proofs. And you actually ask a smart contract on StockNet, is it true that on Arbitrum, this user owns this thing? And then you're done in the way it works. So you actually have a double thing. Um, Arbitrum always sends information to the layer one just because they're sending the, the, their state back to layer one. That's how layer, layer two works. And what Herodotus does is it takes the state roots of L1 and puts it on StockNet. So you know on StockNet, whatever happens on L1. Therefore, you know on StockNet, whatever happens on all the other layer twos. That's just crazy. Realms and other games on StockNet is also implementing this um, to save on, on bridging. So proof of storage is just crazy, crazy good tech. Definitely, uh, definitely look it up. Um, abusing call data. So call data is just the raw data you're sending to uh, in, your, in your transaction. This is the one part that you should completely and absolutely abuse when you're building stuff. On Brick, we have a rule system. For instance, we can say, uh, okay, I'm going to, to certify that what you're building is an official construction only and only if it matches a uh, shape. A shape in the context of brick is like a matrix. It's like X, Y, Z, there's a brick there and a color. So what we do is we store a model of this on chain. And then whenever you're building something, we're going to match it against that. 
And we can do this because what we're actually doing is we're passing the entire thing uh, by Fox, the entire thing that you're building as call data and match it against something else. And you can do that because it's possible to abuse call data on Starknet. That's what Herodotus is also, uh, is also doing. Now I'll go through some of the tricks that we have used at Brick to build our system. Um, so to go back on what exactly, how exactly Brick works, you've got all these tokens. When you assemble an NFT, what we're doing is we're transferring all the Brick tokens that are used to the, um, to the NFT that is being created. And when I'm saying we're sending it to the NFT created, we're transferring it to the set ID, like the ID of the NFT. So it's acting is it's acting as a bit of a wallet. So like you can ask balance of of this thing of this address, and it gives you the bricks back. So we're act, we're having the NFT um, acting as a sort of a wallet. When you're burning the NFT, the NFT disappears, and we're sending all the tokens inside of it back to the owner of the main NFT. So some of the tricks that we have used to Again, abuse computation and save on storage. Um, compressing information. The bricks have different materials. We're able to tell them apart. But rather than having an entire new function and a new storage variable like, OK, material, we said, is there a way we can fit this somewhere else? And we've done this in, what we, in the brick token ID. So 1155 tokens have an ID. And we said, OK. We're going to actually store the material of that brick inside the token ID to just save on cost. So that's what you can see on the on the left hand side. 0x50, that's the NFT identifier. That's, that's the fifth uh, material. And then the rest of it is just, OK, how many materials are there? You can also notice that that allows us to have a difference between fungible and non-fungible materials. So that's a bit the that's the tricky part. Some bricks are fungible with each other. They're just considered like a grain of salt is the same one as another grain of salt. Um, but some of them are different, but have the same material. That's the weird thing. So you can have two identical, uh, let's say, gold bricks, but you can also have gold brick number one, gold brick number two, gold brick number three. And we're able to do this very, very cheaply because of the brick token ID uh, trick that I'm explaining here. These are all the other resources that you can go through about like the other stuff that people have built on Stocknet, how you can do that. Uh, I think I did not put the Robo Teddy's gospel, so we'll promptly add it after the presentation. So thank you so much for coming and thanks to the, the brick team as well. Uh, we always love working with you guys. Um, we all have there are a couple of Paris hackers around as well. Uh, so uh, it was really, really good. Uh, to see you again and uh, thank you to all of you uh, tomorrow we'll be have another workshop uh, it is uh, bridging on starknet uh, it will be run by ben from starkware um, yeah so we'll have one last uh, workshop i'm pretty sure so very excited for that and uh, yeah so thank you so much really appreciate it perfect and um, in the next uh, presentation ask him why they should even bridge if they have storage proofs that will surely get their bloods raising <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. There's a little challenge for the for the floor. Uh perfect. Lovely. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers everyone. Mm -hmm.